so 50, what? Um, yeah, this is going to be a full-on Lion's Lair episode that will post where 51 should be. So, episode 50 what? 50.5. 50. 50.5. 50. 50. Um, Wait, Steven, look at you! <laughs> <laughs> You're a fright! <laughs> Steven's like, Dan has no position to be where he is, ever. Great. So, um, this is going to be handed off to Kit, and if you watched our first Lion's Lair episode where Joey and Steven got to talk with Kit and talk about uh, the story and their perspective as players and characters, um, as kind of a little break after episode 50, this is going to be space for us all to do that together, and uh, I really enjoyed it with uh, those two to get to talk through it and answer some questions myself as a DM, but also to get a unique perspective of what Joey thinks when he's playing Misery and what Steven thinks when he's playing Program. And we've had 20 or so episodes since that one, so uh, we're going to take this time to stop and chat and let Kit be the MC. Uh, and work through questions and thoughts as he's prepared and watched 50 episodes of King Leo D&D. Don't know why. Thank you, Kit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't either. It is entertaining knowing all of you guys. Uh, hey, congrats to you. 50 episodes over a year. Woo! Thank you. Yeah. That's impressive. We clap this, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to... Yeah. That's all you get. Um... Yeah, these, this is crazy. Just, hey, congrats to you guys in that. Uh, committing to anything for over a year is very hard. Uh, and committing to D&D &D for over a year is pretty much unheard of. So either you guys have all been brainwashed and uh, Dan's doing a great job with that, or you guys truly enjoy it, which is really fun. So I'm going to say it somewhere in between those two. Um, kind of with that jumping in, I, I want to hear about you guys a lot more, your PCs, kind of what you guys created. Um, talked to Steven and Joey last time about uh, Misery and Pilgrim War, um, but kind of an easy one, kind of a softball for you guys starting off. Doesn't need to be everyone, but um, how did you come up with your name for your character? Uh, if it's something that's going to come up in, in story later, you can pass on that. Um, but just love to hear like kind of the thought process behind there. I have a very easy answer. Um, uh, often with elves and specifically it, like within the backstory of my character, it is common for, so typically, um, elves don't get a name until they come into adulthood. Um, which is, as I think everyone knows now at this point, it was around the time that my entire village was destroyed. And so instead of like my village bestowing a name upon me because I came into adulthood, I had to choose it myself. And so I took half of my mom's name and half of my dad's name. My mom's name was Lorelei. My dad's name was, was Strokoff. Aww. So together it makes Lorelei. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Stroke, uh, stroke off was your dad's. Uh huh. That was my dad's name. She said that once. So she Did she? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so, cool. And then Pine Wind is just my family's name. Mm -hmm. It was just a good wood elf last name. But yeah, that's that's how it came to be. I feel like wasn't Tuli Paulo also a like marriage of a mom and dad name? No. Okay. Well. <laughs> No. no, 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 actually, maybe it was, um, but that was, like, after the fact, mm -hmm. because I was just looking it up now, Tuli Palo means, mm -hmm. is a Finnish word, and oh. it actually means, Tuli Palo is a fire that is out of control, often accidental, and causing damage. Nice. <laughs> wow. So, and then, Jigyasu, I, was, I can't find it now, but I think it's a... Um, it's a Hindi word that means like curious. Hmm. So, but then we retconned it to say that like mm -hmm. yes, Tuli was my mom's name and right. Paulo was my dad's name. Right. So yes. Right, so I remember in the character creation now coming up for both of you, and I was like, huh, I wonder if that will ever come out in a way where it's like, oh, I'm also the, the both of my parents' names in one. Hmm. Glad we remembered. <laughs> <laughs> High five. We didn't. Uh, mine's definitely less glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> um, I play disc golf a lot, and a disc that I threw a bunch was called a felon. They name all of their discs after, like, uh, patriotic things, uh, more, like, legal things, so, like, there's felons and guards and all that, and so 
uh, I was holding a disc called a felon, <laughs> and I was thinking like, how how can I make this sound cool? Um, and the th just came into my head of felon, and I thought that it sounded more of a mystical kind of name. So it was a, a play on something that I was literally looking at in my hand, <laughs> and trying to shift it to be a little more um, made up, if you will. Man, I really wished that story was going to you were holding a felon in your hand and Caleb <laughs> came outside and said, Daddy, it's a felon! <laughs> because he's small and can't say it some words. <laughs> yeah. talk about Oba, too. Oh, yeah, and then no. uh, Oba, Oba the fox is named after... Um, our dog that passed away like two years ago. Her name was Millie, but we called her Oba, and so I and uh, she, we always said it was like a, a fox uh, a lot of times, and so kind of bringing her into uh, the story and and just my love of animals and wanting to have a a comrade next to me that um, didn't have to do much, but was always kind of present for a sense of comfort just in the presence of of nature and creation and stuff. Millie was my best friend. <laughs> oh. <sighs> I have to move on from that. So we'll cry. I was very good friends with her. She's tattooed on my arm. <laughs> yeah, it was very good. Um, so Gwendolyn Stone. Um, Gwendolyn is just like some correlation to bees. That's fine. But um, in my like lore that I made, if you will, um, Gwendolyn is like a descendant of a character that I played in a previous campaign um, with with Dan and some friends from Ohio, and uh, that character's name was Opal Stone, um, and that was who I played, and a lot of the same tendencies, bear, shifter, jar of bees. Um, she also had a uh, sick honey dipper that was her weapon that I like hope Gwendolyn finds mm -hmm. one day or something, but we'll see. Um, but, uh, Opal didn't have any children, but her sister, um, Ruby did, and I just <laughs> like the name Stone, so I said all the women, like, are the ones that, uh, the, the husband takes the, the wife's <laughs> last name, so, uh, Ruby <laughs> Stone remained, and so, down the line, Woodland Stone, yeah, but it was just kind of a ongoing of this, um, family from the Icewind Dale campaign. <laughs> so is it actually... Gwendolyn's actually related to that family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah. Yeah. And my brother's name is Sting because it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and my parents are hippies but named their kid Sting. So. Nice. Sweet. That's awesome. What about, uh, we can just sum up Pilgrim and Misery too in that. Yeah. Um, I mean, my name is Misery Burnix. <laughs> if you don't get it, then sorry. <laughs> um, but... You don't get it? <laughs> Do you really? Really? business? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I could have been more obvious, but... <laughs> the, <laughs> I actually didn't get it. <laughs> yeah. Misery. The tieflings, like, name... They, they can have first names that are, like, just a character trait. So, Misery was, like, <laughs> perfect, because... You were oh, born, and your mom was like, gosh, this big is wrong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can be, like, Harmony and, like, Peace or whatever, but... <laughs> misery is good. <laughs> Um, it's a cool name. Because, I don't know. It, it fits his personality, I think. It can be harmony um, or peace. <laughs> or misery. And then Burnus came after, because puns. So. Mm. Classic puns. Yeah, I don't remember if it was revealed or not at the point when we talked about it last time, but Pilgrim is basically just a, a moniker that Nemo uses instead of his real name, because he, does, he feels like he... Yeah. Uh, Kalistar's names are connected to their deities and he feels like he's failed so he can't use his real name anymore so he uses this as a stand-in. Um, How'd you pick this? Huh? How'd you pick Pilgrim? Oh, just like he... I, I always pictured it as like Trikasho kind of met him when he was wandering without any memories anymore. Uh, and he just kind of came up with... It could have been like Wanderer or Traveler or anything but he's just, oh, it's Pilgrim. I'm traveling along. You I know, see. I'm a Pilgrim. How'd you pick Nemo? It was a uh, well. Numero is the god, and so mm -hmm. the their names were always formulations off of Numero, and so. It's not because Finding Nemo is your favorite movie. <laughs> no, <laughs> although it's very good, but you know Nemo is like the little helpless. The, he's the little broken, <laughs> broken fish who learns to be whole. You know where Nemo kind of happens. Australia. Australia. <laughs> Australia. Yeah. Shout, Shout out, out to Australia. Australia. Wallaby Way. <laughs> That's right. Uh, also. Uh, Ramuin is the full name of Remy, 
who was mm. the uh, Kalishar that you were searching after in uh, Dust Forge. And so her name is also an anagram of Numero. Oh. Uh, so that's one of the character names I've gotten to create as part of <laughs> the story. I was going to say. No, Dan, yeah. nobody cares about your character. No, Dan, how'd you come Just up kidding. with your name? Dan? Yeah. Where does Dan come from? I'm named after Dan Marino. Really? Oh, yeah, you are. Wow. Let's yeah. go. Sports. Is that big, your... big sports guy over there. I will say, uh, I every time I heard stroke off, I thought like stroganoff or yeah. like <laughs> I'm sort of so the whole time I'm like, what the heck? So that sounds like really, I'm like, oh, that's that's sweet, that's kind of endearing. I shouldn't pick on it. Um, <laughs> but I, I do want to see Oba and stroke off in a, um, a death match. And so the owners decide who, uh, who wins that? Stroke off. Oba yeah. or stroke off. But they're best Easy. friends. They would never. Stroke off yeah. would never. There's a level of respect that I think Oba realizes uh, <laughs> stroke off's strength and views stroke off as a protector. And I think that stroke off enjoys the uh, responsibility of caring for another four-legged creature besides all the other two-legged creatures that it cares for. <laughs> yeah, I think Shrokov too, I kind of imagine him similar to uh, Gwenlin in a way that it's like, you don't you don't like to rage, it's not your favorite thing to do, but you do it when you need to, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of how I imagine, especially because like w I mean, we I found him in a evil scientist lab, you know, like he was not born this way. <laughs> he was, yeah, he was experimented on and doesn't, doesn't necessarily it. need to have his, his powers and wasn't designed to be that way when he was created. Um, and so I think that he kind of, the way that I view him is that he uses those powers when I ask him to and in defense of his quote unquote pack that we are, but if it, he had it his way, he's much more of, like, a gentle giant that, like, and that's why him and Oba have such a fondness and, like, play and run in circles together is because, like, he's so much more of a gentle giant than, like, this big, scary wolf that can breathe fire <laughs> <laughs> on people mm -hmm. and rip heads off and mm -hmm. things like that. <laughs> he's graciously forgotten that we killed his brothers in the caverns. Mm -hmm. Forgotten the moment we met. Good. He was like, you're home, and I said, yeah, I am. That's okay. <laughs> So I, I basically heard that stroke off would underestimate Oba and that would be the death of him. So <laughs> yeah, I'll feel that. Um, kind of, again, staying with your characters that you guys have created. Um, there's kind of a two part question to this. So, uh, you know, it feels like Laura Leth is probably the most mistrusting of the group here and sometimes can make things more difficult with actions. Uh, Joey, how similar is this? And Sally and Laura with like are they, is there are they similar in this or are they completely different? Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question that I'm not gonna answer. <laughs> answer it. Well, it's a great segue. No, no, he doesn't have to answer. He can answer it for his own. It's a great segue of how are you similar to your character in real life? Where do you see some of your similarities coming through in who you're portraying on screen? No, I want him to answer the question. Answer the question. <laughs> Huh? How are you? Yeah. Annoying? That's not what the question <laughs> was. You <laughs> twisted that. Um, mistrusting. I don't know, because how are you mistrusting? Uh, no. I don't know. You you see the worst in people? Do you want me to talk about this right now? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk about this now? All right. <laughs> cool. I'll answer your question, Kit. <laughs> yeah, you do. Um, I think that in a lot of ways... Loreleth is <laughs> the most extreme version of myself. I am a very type A Enneagram one. Um, I am kind of person that's very like rules oriented and uh, justice oriented. And so that's why even in the like, when we ran into the odd company, the reason that that was such a big deal to me is because it's like, it was wrong mm -hmm. to who I like am as a person. 
who Laura Lith is as a person. And so, like, while I, in my real life, would never, like, <laughs> you know, uh, stand up and, and fight that seriously for something that, that seems kind of, you know, a little bit frivolous, um, I think I kind of imagine Laura Lith as that, and also because of the wounds that she has in her past, she would rather plan for the worst and hope for the best. And so that's kind of her like motto in life. And I understand and can relate to that outlook, but I think that I, yeah, I guess just the best way to describe it is like, she's me to an extreme, <laughs> I guess. But I do have a tendency to like, be more, I don't want to say see the worst in people, I want to say be more realistic. <laughs> why, did you, why, why did that come to mind? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who people are. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's that's the similarities and differences between Laura Leth and I. And I think I'm a lot less hesitant to mm, make new friends than she is. Um, and to be like in a new a new play. I'm much less hesitant to change than Laura Leth is in a lot of ways. Something else going on. So my, I'm an extrovert as a person to where I like enjoy hanging out around people, but there's a dream side of me in like a different world where I would be like a van lifer just by myself. <laughs> uh, and so some of that comes from some of Thelen's character as a wanderer is like a weird, unattainable, I don't want to say desire because that sounds kind of messed up. Like, I want to be by myself because I don't. But it's just like a weird kind of dream of like, what would it be like to be like a renegade person that's just off on your own, relying on the land and nature? Um... And some of the character traits came from Daryl from The Walking Dead as <laughs> someone who is very hard, but also has a really good relationship with Carol. Um, and so I think that some of my relationship with Laurel is like that, where even though I'm a quieter person, I see, um, I see hurt in people and desire them to know that it's okay but also to hopefully find peace. Um, and so that's a lot of like my communication, whether verbally with people um, in like arguments and stuff, like when the, um, who are the people that we just ran into that you mentioned? The Odd Company. The Odd Company, it was like, we're safe now, like let's let this go and then we can get peace in your village later. Like kind of understanding the hurt and then desiring a uh, resolution is kind of where his mindset goes. Um, and then also, just as a person, I love nature. I love being outside. I think that nature is beautiful and it's all unique in its own. And so a lot of my characteristics of seeing that come out in, in Thelen as well. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. I am also a vegetarian in real life. And so that's <laughs> where that comes from. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Not in a bad way. Just from like listening on the podcast, I can I just feel the conviction coming out. Of the I mean, in some ways, it's like Pilgrim is intentionally not the like. In some ways, he's not, and then I guess on a deeper, less exciting way, is in the sense of like my go-to is to be like loud and goofy and chaotic, particularly in a D&D &D setting. <laughs> and so there's a level where Pilgrim was like, I want to try as hard as it is to be the the last person to immediately rush in or to be the more observant instead of quick actioning. Or like, it's not just about cracking jokes and doing whatever the wild thing is, you know? Um, so I think like more tapping into that level of like... <laughs> without laying down on the therapist couch too much, it's like, oh, well, sometimes there's a level of, oh, if I can be really funny, if I can advance all these good traits, it can be to make up for what I perceive as all the bad traits. And so I think for the same way with Pilgrim, it's like if I'm peaceable and good now, it makes up for the broken past. Hmm. And it's this level of like overcompensating for, you know, you're your own harshest critic and who keeps a better record of wrongs than yourself. And it's that same kind of 
I think mentality that drives through for sure. And Stefano? Stefano. Yeah. Stefano. Uh, yeah. So that's just like my deep love of quilts and yelling at Joey. <laughs> Combined in one person. Uh, to kind of back up Stephen on that too, I remember when we were talking about Pilgrim and Stephen told me, he's like, I want to be the, this end of the spectrum, like really hard onto this. And like I, in the back of my mind, and I did not say this to you, it was just like, that'll last like five sessions. <laughs> and that's fine. Like, because you, you, like, man, committing to a character in DD is very hard. And especially when we're hitting 50 episodes, let alone the fact that the story's maybe a third done. We'll see. Like, I'm not even sure. Uh, but it's like, I, I know times we've played Three. campaigns where it's like a couple episodes in or a couple sessions in. Um, you're like, man, I'm already tired of playing this character. And it's like, yeah, that kind of fatigue of committing to the same character gets hard. <clears throat> and so I was thinking, like, we'll see. Like, I, I can see this. But, man, you've done a phenomenal job. Like, Pokemon seems so consistent mm-hmm. and does seem very much like he is... He is developing as a character that really has these innate traits, or I feel like it's even probably hard for you to deviate from that because Pokemon feels so developed in that area. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Kind of with with that going forward, Dan, what NPC is most like you in real life? Mm-hmm. I'd love to say Farragrand, but that's definitely not true. <laughs> no, it's um, Munkin. <laughs> No, it's Grinch. Or Hunkle. Actually, I think it's Savarin. Um, And Savarin, man, Savarin has become (laughs) a a very. (laughs) um, (laughs) Missing? Missing. Missing. Honestly, I think I relate a lot because, like, what's there's a lot of unknowns to Savarin right now, so I don't want to speak too much on what she's going through and what's happening, but what. Um, what is happening is this, like, uh, kind of thrust into the real world without much knowledge of herself or what's going on around her. Mm-hmm. And then as she's learning and she's it, she interacted with the party and started to get a sense of, like, herself and what's going on in Populous and her role in all of that and what's going on with her, like, she's at this big crisis moment of, all right, who am I and what am I doing? Mm-hmm. And so in this panic of... Uh, all of that dilemma and all of that uh, literal, like the literal definition of crisis of like, all right, I need to make a decision and figure out like, what does this mean? Uh, I relate like, and there's a lot of things in my life that I'm like, oh, I can see where the stage is for her. And so I can kind of channel that into her character. And she's become like a really big like soft spot for me as mm-hmm. I've been playing into this story. It's been really easy to kind of like role play. What is she doing and what is she thinking uh, to then just immediately on the fly, just like, run her into what's going on with the campaign. Sweet. Rachel, what about you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think that in a lot of ways I'm very similar to Thule. Um, and there's a couple of key differences, but the similarities are I am a huge people pleaser. Mm. And the way that I... <laughs> what? The way, it's true. Mm. <laughs> the way that I interact with people as Thule is maybe an extreme, but mm. it's similar to the way that I interact with mm. people in real life. Very people pleasy, very like accommodating, very... Um, yeah, a little... little Aside comments, just basically similar except not in a Valley Girl accent, <laughs> <laughs> which interestingly I've pretty much lost over the last couple of yeah. <laughs> the last like twenty episodes. But uh, also I love making jokes, um, so that is a, like the opposite of Steven. That's something that I've leaned into in this character. That's been really fun. My last character in D&D was very serious. It was like a Bruce Wayne imitation, mm-hmm. and so he did not make jokes at all. Um, and so this has been fun to play Tuli. The way that I am different is that I am extremely competitive, and I don't know, maybe y'all could know that or don't know that, but um, I hate losing. And so Tuli does not care about winning. She only cares about making friends and protecting people that she loves. And so any time that Tuli has lost, which has been many times, <laughs> dare I say every time except this time, and Apple off. Actually, see, like, that's me. I'm fixating on the losses. I'm like, I lose every time, which I don't. But um, instead of the competitiveness that has put me in a bad mood, I have channeled that into Tuli being upset that she's confronting someone from her past, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is what Tuli would be upset about. 
Whereas I'm just in a, like, being a sore loser because I'm very competitive. Mm. <laughs> Which I know you can't win D&D, but I want to find a way. I mean, you can, though. <laughs> You'll find a way. I'll find a way. So that's what I, I mean, would say about Tulu. I have to know. Yeah. I've seen you doing this in real life since the campaign has started. Really? Yes. <laughs> Is that because, yes, and my question yeah, was going to be, really yeah. do you do it, did you do it before the campaign or is it just like a habit now? I do. I've done it. All, I think I did it before the campaign. Did it's you? Like, okay. It's a way of being like, not coy, but like. Are you a hand talker? Yes. Okay. I'm like, I just specifically yeah. remember on Sunday at one point, <laughs> you were like. <laughs> it was like. Oh! <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Rachel, please stop talking to me. Please. We're begging you. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Joey, what about you with Misery? It's your turn. <laughs> um, misery is... Burdness. <laughs> misery Burdness is the, like, punk kid that I never got to be, basically. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Because um, he's not, I mean, he's not really anything like me now. Um, I'm, like, a little <laughs> follower. Um but our similarities lie in just like the music side. Um, so I wanted to make like a pop punk bard um, because I like pop punk music and stuff, but I had to make him young because as an old man in, <laughs> in my late twenties, I'm not allowed to be a punk kid. I so. think you offended both of <laughs> 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 Um, but yeah, so it's like, I don't know, it's more of like the, this is what I could have been if I was, you know, 20 again, um, but it's too late now, so. <laughs> I think you're a lot more like Misery than yeah. you yeah. think you are. Yeah. Definitely his personality in, uh. How mean he is. <laughs> I think like mannerisms and stuff, probably, yeah. But he's like he's, he's like he doesn't do the right thing all the he's time. He's a jokester too. That's though. annoying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's he, what I'm saying. He's a jokester, and he like so. It's the sarcasm. Sometimes we yeah. have like inside thoughts, um, and misery doesn't have any, <laughs> <laughs> and like. You sometimes say your inside thoughts out loud, and yeah. I say, Joey, that's an inside thought. We don't <laughs> say that out loud. And so I imagine that misery is like you if you had zero filter. Yeah. It's Joey without sound. No, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a TV series. Yeah. 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 I've been told so many times that Joey and misery are the same. Yeah. By Sally. So. <laughs> When Joey didn't yeah. meet Sally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, it's hard to play a character without right. being yeah. yourself. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Um, especially yeah. when you you want to be funny a lot. It's know? hard to play a character without being mean to Stephen. Yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> totally, totally understand that, but not the funny part. Cassandra, what about you? Oh, mine's not going to be as interesting in her introspective as other people's, because <laughs> um, I'm pretty neutral like Gwen, pretty non-combative. Uh, I don't rage ever externally, but I am pretty ragey inside actually. Um, most people wouldn't know. Uh, but yeah, I, I do have a bit of a short temper, but I'm not, I'm not strong enough to beat people up and <laughs> God tells me not to. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah. it's a it's a shame, but not a shame at all that we lost the horribly awkward Gwen interacts with her family mm. episode because mm -hmm. I feel like that's pretty comparable, just like <laughs> extremely mismatched like expectations and things like that. Oh, I hope they don't watch this. Um, <laughs> don't say anything, Dad's engineer friend who watches us. <sighs> Um, Immediately calling. Hey, Jerry. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. In the morning. Cassandra yeah. plays a bear. <laughs> yeah. She rages and she says she's not like that at all in real life. <laughs> Agree or disagree? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we both like bees, so there's that. Um, yeah, I, I think the definitely the, like, observation, not quick to step in or make decisions, wants all the facts before deciding anything. That's very much who I am. This whole, like business pursuant like uh medieval influencer type that she tries to be but honestly we've had a lot going on so she hasn't had much 
to much time to push her business. That's very much not me. That was like a different thing that we decided to push into actually inspired by like some of our other friends. I was like, yeah, if I just like think about that person, I could like kind of channel this into Gwen, but I feel like we've been so busy with them. Um, with killing people that I haven't had time to do that. <clears throat> I am not very entre entrepreneurial. I can't even say the word, so. Totally understand in real life when you're killing a lot of people, it's it's hard to make time for just those pastimes. So uh, kind of a change of pace a little bit. Everyone grab a D20 and uh, roll that bones for me. Uh, looking for the highest and the lowest Over. right now. So if, if that's you, just kind of raise your hand. Oh, you got a nat 20. The no, that's highest the and lowest? What? There's no way. Yes, ma'am. What? Oh, okay, the little underground. So little underground Wait, what was the instruction? No, just rolling at once. I, I just want the highest number and the lowest number. 17. I 14. Got seven. Three. Okay. 12. Really the lowest. What'd you get? I got an eight, though. Okay. 17, 17 and three? Steven and mm -hmm. I thought you got a nat 20. Right. Was it a nat 20? Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, sweet. Hey, Stephen and Dan, this is for you guys. In honor of the weird, uh, weird Al Yankovic, the story movie that just came out. Uh, yeah. What song would Weird Al parody of the half dozen kind of summarize what you guys are doing? Oh, cool. Cool. Stephen, this question was made for you. Yeah. Weird Al. What song in real life would be the parody about us? That Daniel Radcliffe would perform Perfect. as Yeah, Madonna. what would uh what would Weird Al actually take from the current song and make about the half dozen? Well, I am embarrassed that I both immediately thought of the song and to my greatest shame Oh, all too well, the long version. Yes, ten minute version. The ten minute all too well. Parentheses ten minute version, parentheses Taylor's version. Yeah. Yeah. It Sad girl pond session? It's got to be something to the length of <laughs> Deep Cut for Weird Al, but Albuquerque. Like a long, a long story format type song. Mm -hmm. You're saying so many words that I don't <laughs> I don't understand. I understand it. I fully understand. Weird Al has like a 12 minute song called Albuquerque. And it's just one long story about a trip to Albuquerque. It's not a parody of anything. He, it's just his own song. But it would be like that. You need that length of time to get through everything ah. that we've been doing. So it has to be Taylor Swift. So you would like you would like Weird Al to parody his own song about you. Is that what I heard? <laughs> I, no, I like that it's all too well. The Weird Al version. does all too well, and then it's still Sadie Sink and Dylan O'Brien, yes. different hats, yes. being the half dozen for the music video yes. of the ten minute, all too well. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I just agree with what Steven said. Yeah. <laughs> Good answer, Dan. I appreciate that. Yes. Yes. Um, where does the scar cool. come in? I mean, Taylor can be Martha if she wants to. The most important question. <laughs> what? Where does the scarf come in? Where does the scarf come in? On well, Scarf on Week. Stefan. On the Scarf The thousand? The thousand thread. Yeah. <laughs> the thousand thread scarf. He wants the thousand! Yeah. That represents Taylor. Never mind. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> That's my answer. Dan like Dan left. Dan's leaving. Bye, Dan. Dan no. Dan's gonna go find that song on his own right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so or he's doing something behind me, and you guys are all looking at him. I thought you were looking at me, but you're probably looking at Dan. Yeah, we're good. Uh, cool. Moving moving kind of forward with some of the stuff. Um, going into the storyline, you guys spent the majority of fifty episodes living in Populous, um, all of which took place in a total of like two days real life time but it took a year plus for you guys to actually get out of that city you guys met a ton of fun npcs um sally with Lorelith really having a couple strong deep relationships grungeon savarin um you know pilgrim's great relationship with martha uh you guys had some really cool moments there um, but my real question is, how do you guys feel being multiple homeowners? I mean, in the market that it is right now, like that's pretty impressive to have a couple different homes that you guys can choose from. Uh, just one or two of you guys kind of touch on two homes right now. Yeah. We're pretty I have, rich. I have a home. <laughs> I have Grinch's home. Yeah. Laura and Gwen are doing pretty well. Sister's home? <laughs> yeah. We have the sister mansion. It's the, funny. The yeah. sh what is it called? The half, the half shot. shot. The half shot. And then also Grinjin's house. Yeah. It's funny that we have, that it even got built 
you know, since Cicero is absolutely dead to us. <laughs> Over a year later, Cicero. I still disagree with that being our payment, but whatever. Yeah. yeah, same. I think it's funny to think about the fact that Cicero's dad is buried in the backyard of our house. Cicero's cat. dad and is buried can... in the backyard. <laughs> yes, buried in the backyard. <laughs> Reed, he is still the main villain. He planted the tree he that did. you found. He did. He's the origin of evil. It's true. Yeah. I would like you to dig up um, Cicero's dad and reanimate him, please, Michael. Oh, yeah. That. That's our next question. Does that thing. answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> what was the question? Uh. No, not at all. And it's fine. We're going to keep moving forward. Um, kind of with that, two of you guys purchased a home while the half dozen was getting multiple homes. Cassandra, compare and contrast purchasing your own home and in-game purchasing a home. Uh, similar similar stresses, similar eases. I mean, how was the inspection report in-game? Yeah, there was no inspection report in the game. So, you know, Lorelith and I were just kind of taking a gamble there, and Lorelith didn't even know about it. So it's really true. Just, it feels a lot cheaper <laughs> in d and Yeah. Like, a lot, and there's no utility bills to transfer over. So yeah. that was, like, nice in some ways. Um, if we could somehow risk our life on an adventure to pay for our home, <laughs> I, I think we would do it. You would do that. I would not. <laughs> um, I want Laurel's real garden in my in my <laughs> yard. Yeah. So I mean, pros and cons. Pros and cons. <laughs> I don't think there's any cats Maybe. in the D and D homes. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, there's no cats over there. Grungeon didn't leave any cats or anything. No, I'll have to find one. Yeah. yeah. Grungeon didn't have any cats. Ooh. The DM didn't put any in in the Isro, the Shat hat. Nobody asked about that. We, all, we, we saw that recently. kick-ass line with the wings. And then I'll pro- no, I'll probably steal the like, nine-tailed, yeah. six-eyed cat. Oh, yeah. Someone tell me his name. Oh, but, my but gosh. Yeah. Say, say good, 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 No, good. it starts with a B. I wrote it down. Blue. Baraft. Drinton. Brackish. Kit doesn't know either. Strazzle. Mm-hmm. No, that's the dragon. No, I do. You know the cat? Strazzle Dazzle. Yeah, I saw the cat. Um, I also watched this previous episode that you guys recorded as well. Um, if you look at the lion up in the back wall, uh, there is a... You guys all looking up there. There's a camera in there I put in there uh, <laughs> this weekend just so I could watch. So, uh, did some great stuff. There's some weird things. Uh, Rachel, that one thing you did, we can talk about later. That was. <laughs> we all got it. You're gonna he have saw. to be a lot more specific. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you guys left Populous. You guys had a, quite a few cool relationships. Um, some powerful people you met, um, Munkin, um, you know, Rickledar, your sponsor. Um, is there any loose ties that you guys still have at Populous? Obviously, you got your homes and stuff, but is there anything that you guys are like, ooh, we never wrap that up, or we need to go and touch base on that again? Uh, yeah. Where's Savarin? Where's Savarin? Yeah. <laughs> I would like to sell more beer. Well, there. Do you care about your band at all? No, they're really mean to me. <laughs> they're, dead. they're dead to him. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to start your own band? I have new friends. Solo gig? I'm very happy with my new friends. Aww. Yes. And you get to meet an orphan soon, I think. <laughs> a we dwarf do get fan. to go to an orphanage so I can teach. <laughs> uh, Treya. Treya. We'll lay your name. How to be a good person. <laughs> oh, you should teach kids music. <gasps> at the dwarfenage. Wow. I should. You'd be really good at that. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, yeah. I wanna Speaking see of... You. Mostly Savarin. Do, does anyone think that they have an idea of where Savarin is or what's going on with her? In the, uh... I think that I think that her disappearance being when the Aboleth was killed is very, very relevant. I also think, I feel strongly that the Aboleth and the like Chuloth and everything that's in the lake is somehow connected to Thule showing up in the lake mm. and like a portal or something. And I think that Whoa. all of those things somehow, some way connect to each other. Mm. But this is total speculation. I think this you're probably right. Confirmed or denied. Dan's not good. Look at Dan's face. Look at his face. I think Savar. Uh, deception or, or persuasion. 
I'm just taking notes. <laughs> I think Savari could be in, um, what's the place? Yeah, the that's other place. excellent question. What is that place called? Apori. Apori. I think Apori, she... yeah. 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 Savarin, Cicero, Cicero's dad, <laughs> are all hiding out together. <laughs> yeah. I like how none of us were like, oh, you know the loose end we should wrap up? Cicero? Cicero. <laughs> no, instead we're Misery like, Misery NPC. cares about Cicero. Do you? Yes. Use your glass then. Misery cares about Cicero. No one else does. I think you're a little glass Felon to never met him. Unfinished business is getting Cicero Stone. off the shirt Dan's wearing and yeah. adding Felon <laughs> would be very important. I've already done that. Nice. Yeah. Have you? Mm -hmm. Nice. You can order it on the King Lotta D&D shop. Mm -hmm. Shout out Australia. <laughs> Yep. Have they ordered anything? Shout out Australia. Has Australia ordered anything? I don't know. To answer your first question, there was a there was a, a, a entirely other plot line, like an alternate timeline, where where Pilgrim could have gone down this road of training to be a rogue, but he failed his one test yes. trying to get into that meeting. He <laughs> ruined his interaction with Siagrius, the bartender. And it's just like severed, like butterfly effect. This path will never happen, Steven. Because I botched my meeting. I will be honest with you. You did so terribly. Yeah. Like you. Yeah. Not the character. You. <laughs> yeah. As Sorry. a person. Tell inside, me again how you're different. Oh, the misery. <laughs> yeah. And see, this is the misery. This is the misery. Didn't see yeah. what was happening at all. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred. Well, you're so stupid. <laughs> also, <laughs> Let me, let me redeem this a little bit. Uh, and this is a, 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 the nature of D&D is that things like this happen where, like, I've had to plan for, like, so many possibilities mm. of things that would happen in Populous that, like, the Siagrius and Chikasho, like, plot line could have been really a main thread of the way that the campaign went and the way that the party uh, navigated Populous. Uh, and I can think of specific examples of one, maybe two for each character, where there were things like that, where it's like, oh, there were like really heavy, their character intensive things that could have been the main thread of progressing through Populous. And it really just came up to like, what do the players do? What, how do the dice uh, collaborate with that too? In a way that just completely forms this story where it's like, man, this could have gone over a dozen ways. But the way that people role played it out, the way that the dice worked out, this is the one path that, that came out of it. So it's really neat that like that one that you're thinking of is like, man, I can I can think of like six to eight others for other people too, where it's like we we only have so much space and time to do whatever we're doing. Or for you to like go on and yeah. do it with Martha. Yeah. Mm. It's true. Just give her a chance. <laughs> We're, sh we're shipping yeah, really Pilgrim and Martha. <laughs> you guys really only have, I mean, so many things to do, and you guys are only about a 16th of the way through this campaign. So, I mean, yeah. keeps growing. Uh, you guys trusted uh, Treya Lethargica, Valerian, pretty close, uh, to go to Dustforge. Uh, I personally am super excited about Dust Forge. I think it has lots of really cool things from what we've heard already. Um, but before we go into that, kind of as you guys were going, you did, we touched on this a little bit, you guys ran into the Odd Company. Um, for people playing in a campaign kind of for their first time, how does it feel knowing that there is another potential adventuring group that's happening at the exact same time as what you guys are doing? I didn't even think about it that way until you just said it. <laughs> are you are you cheating on us? Is there another group that you're... <laughs> Is this going to be a collab? I'll let you guys process the odd company for a little bit and those ramifications um, of a world that's pretty alive. Um, it was kind of fun from from a uh, from an Australian. It was really fun to. I also stir the pot a lot. Um, if you have not picked up on that, most of my stirring is very truthful, though. It was fun as a spectator watching you guys interact with a uh, another adventuring party. Um, it was a small interaction, um, but we saw Thule and the Torrent go one on one. Uh, we saw you guys come back on that again. Um, kind of as you guys are processing this right now, as I'm talking about it, any any initial thoughts or anything that might bring up that you're like, dang, we might run into these guys again. 
I fully anticipate uh, Tari's gonna show up with them as her her new crew at some point. <laughs> like just contrasting, like how um, I'm realizing we haven't aired this episode yet. You're good. But just contrasting how terrible her crew was from <laughs> an episode we just played. I was envisioning, wow, if this was the art company, we'd be in big trouble. <laughs> yeah. So I anticipate that. I mean, it felt very... Hey, I'm going to pause you guys. I'm going to pause for two and a half seconds. Three-year-old who's out of her bed. I'm going to put her back and come right back. <laughs> put her back. Shove her back. Everyone freeze. No, we'll keep... Charlie. <laughs> Are you doing a campaign with him? Hmm? Is this real? Are they doing an odd company campaign and they ran into us? Whose hair is this? <laughs> <laughs> Mine. Is this a collab? Is Matt the torrent? <laughs> what were you going to say, though? You were going to answer the question, and we can still answer the question mm-hmm. with John. Yeah. Um... Oh, it felt very uh, Harry and Malfoy. You know, like it felt like an initial meeting that's like this is about to spawn. Or like when when, when Ash and Gary both show up and it's like we're going to meet multiple times along the way. Mm-hmm. And like, um, felt like the, the, the initial meeting of like a rivalry that would. And that's the end of my great answer. <laughs> Dude, I, Pilgrim, I, I mean, that was incredible, Stephen, how you just crafted that in Pilgrim. Um, and didn't skip a beat. I love that. Like, that's one of the things that's been fun to watch you guys kind of jump into character as you guys play. So anyway, going back to what I was asking, anything else that you guys want to build off of that answer? Uh, not off of that answer, but I think maybe Dan and I have talked about this just, uh, in, and this is not in the campaign, it's meta, but in situations of, um, you know, like TPKs talking about how to like proceed from that. Did we talk about like, what if we all died Mm -hmm. and then we transitioned into like all playing characters from Mm -hmm. the odd company. So I think it's fun to think about that. of like (laughs) horrible thing. And then suddenly this like alternate reality, but I don't know, maybe you and D show and Matt are the odd company. I don't know. I wasn't here much last weekend. So it's hard to say. It is. It is one of the fun things with a world as vibrant as canvas and a pori. Uh, there might be things going on in the background that you guys are unaware of. And I am too, because I have no idea about any of this stuff. Uh, I'm going to briefly hop in on that too. One of my favorite things about the start of this campaign is maybe a year before we played our first episode, uh, I played a one shot with a bunch of guys that I'm friends with in Ohio. And their goal and their role with what they were doing was they were at a founding festival for Populous years before this campaign started. And they played like a kobold and goblins and they played the like kind of outskirts races of people coming into Populous. It's a big part of the founding festival, which you weren't there for, but uh, the whole town dresses up as like a goblin. Um, and uh, kind of celebrate their founding. And so this one shot was people playing uh, those types of races, sneaking into this festival and just like pretending to be normal people. Uh, and they had a goal, which was to actually give the stone to an important NPC within the town. That their leader was like, hey, give this to somebody and gave them a list of names. And so the Fair- Husk Stone? The Husk Stone, yes, thank you. So <laughs> Faragrand was on that list, Monken was on that list. Uh, what's her name? Oh my gosh. Um, Savarin. Uh, no, not Savarin. Uh, the leader of the uh, guard. Um, Jewel. Oh. Uh, oh man. The, Madonna. From, uh, Mrs. Leader. All I can think of is Captain <laughs> Phasma because that's how I picture her in my brain, but obviously um, that's not her name. Yeah. Pin 15. Uh, but anyway, uh, then and they chose Munkin, and so they played <laughs> out uh, a huge part of what kicked off our campaign, which was like, where was this stone, and how was it going to impact uh, like what the formation and what the interactions with NPCs were going to do. And I knew that at the time I was doing the one-shot, knowing we were going to set up this campaign. And so I've used other types of one shots and moments like that to help form what is going on in canvas. It's been really cool. Cool. Yeah. There was a, uh, alternative reality where the founding festival was played out in Raleigh, North Carolina and Munkin sounded like he was from Canada and Felix of great bounds, the uh, great proprietor you guys met very briefly, uh, sounded like Nacho Libre. So, uh, if you'd like to hear my voices for them, you can join my OnlyFans. And you can <laughs> For those voices and some other stuff. Wink, wink. Christopher Southwick.
so it's very weird hearing Munkin just kind of being kind of this and Felix and Peregrine and Rickledar. I'm like, that that's not what they sound like. Um, so, uh, kind of going forward, getting away from the odd company, moving forward and kind of wrapping this thing up a little bit. Uh, you guys made it to Dustforge. Uh, cool city inside, uh, really underground city. Um, you guys have heard of vampires. Um, I mean, shoot. Uh, some people, some vampires have cornered some of you in alleys on the way back to uh, the uh, the West Coast Castle. Um, it's really fun. You guys met Lilith, who, if you guys didn't realize, was a vampire. Her name's Lilith. Like, <laughs> come on, guys, that was right there for you for the taking. Um, but kind of last two questions for you guys. First impressions of, of kind of Dust Forge as you guys have gotten there with these vampires, with this underground, with all that's going on right now. Kind of where are you in headspace when you're thinking of that place? I don't think that it's nearly as peaceful as everyone's making it out to be. Like they're like, oh yeah, we have these families. And they're like, everyone agrees that that everyone has a say and everyone has equal say. Because first of all, just like in reality, that's never true. Like when you have a group project, there's always one person who has the final word. So there's no way that these three families have figured it out. And we know that they haven't because they killed an entire family in a night when they disagreed, which is wild to me as a person, but also Laura Leff as the character. And so because of that, everyone being like, no, no, it's cool. We leave sacrifices for the vampires. And also all the families agree. I'm like, no. Something very fishy is happening here and in this place, and it is not even remotely as peaceful as you're all making it out to be. Yeah. I'll go for it. One of my favorite book series, um, and I, Dan is nodding, so I wondered, as soon as we came into Dust Forge and saw the green firelight and it's an underground city, I wondered if Dan was inspired by this, but if y'all know... Well, it's a Forgotten Realms uh, series, and the main character is a drow elf called Driz Doerden. Oh. Um, the series opens on him in the Underdark in a city that's, uh, there's not any natural light, and it's a really, like, the families of that city are uh, very kind of evil drow, a lot of political infighting, a lot of murder, a lot of assassinations. And so as we kind of came into Dust Forge, I think there's a lot of differences so far. It feels a little bit, I don't know why I'm getting an Old West vibe a little bit from it, but uh, I wonder if- Is this caving big enough? To <laughs> Literally. <laughs> this town's not big enough for the 300 of us. My name's Lilith West Coley. <laughs> <laughs> Tumbleweed goes across. So anyway, that, I, was that, <laughs> Did you steal everything from that book, Dan? Or? Was there any connection there? I mean, yeah, when you're talking about Underdark and you're talking about, like, a drow society, it's, uh, when it comes to, like, the overall lore of the D&D realms and all of that, it's really hard not to uh, pull from Salvatore. He's done so much to develop a society like that. Um, and even when you were talking about your character coming from Apori and what society was like there, and we're kind of talking about the same ecosystem and the same type of atmosphere. I definitely uh, like, was inspired by yeah, those books. Yeah, exactly. So I see Dust Forge as kind of like the trickling of Apori in Canvas. Um, and so those overlaps are going to happen. My ignorant brain, when we got to Dust Forge, the connection that my brain made initially when I heard the word drow, was I thought of Draugr from Skyrim. And I was like, everyone's really calm about this Sorry. undead zombie race. And then I looked it up during last session, I was like, oh, they are elves. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Um, no, but I think that, I mean, Pilgrim, before getting to Death's Forge, I think from the moment that Pilgrim went to the archives, as his whole thing has just been like, getting a hold on my mind again, and he realizes that some of his kinsfolk are in this place. Mm -hmm. There was this very single-mindedness of like, um, oh, like he's got this like connection now with his group and his people. And there's this weird conflict of like, I'm with this sort of found family now. But then also there's this desire to like learn about what even happened with my own, with my family that I came from. 
and those are at odds. And so like th this was all like at, at odds with this of like, I just want to get to Dust Forge, but also there's all this stuff still very much going on at Populous. And so there's kind of this like single minded drive to get to Dust Forge. And I think now that we're here, it's even this level of like, even like getting into the castle when he's kind of like in a place that's ringing so many bells of like where he came from and his own like background. And just like, he's kind of caught up in the kind of overload of, of like, this is, you know, ring a bell of this memory and that memory and that memory. And so he's kind of, you know, as is often the case with Pilgrim, flooded with <laughs> with thoughts and emotions and not able to have the time to just sit with them all because something's happening, you know, beat after beat after beat and kind of getting caught up in the moment. But um, I, Stephen, am very excited about Dust Forge and the possibilities of it. And I think that Pilgrim is also very eager to like investigate all there is to investigate, you know, and just really figure things out. And I just, I just love the kind of Game of Thrones houses, you know, the game of game of houses. I think it's like what they say in like Wheel of Time or whatever it is, the game of, you know, but just like that idea of like, uh, wheel of houses, we, the wheel of house <laughs> game of times. Yes. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Not to like derail from the question, but just to like make the connection to, I think that that was very much the mindset that you were just describing for Pilgrim being in Dust Forge is where Laura Lett's brain went in the confrontation with the Odd Company mm -hmm. and recognizing, like, where she... I mean, very immediately, obviously, being like, this is my home, it's not far, it's right over there, mm -hmm. but we're not going there right now. But then suddenly someone being like, we're there, and it's like, what? That's not cool. And so, yeah, I don't know. Just thought that was cool to make that connection that it's, like, almost an opposite thing because you were like, we can come back and deal with this later. We need to get to Dust Forge. And I'm like, no! We're going to do this, but so I do the opposite thing of like, all right, I'll go deal with that thing, and then we're going to come back to it, whereas you're like, let's go there, and then we can come back to this other stuff. Yeah. It is, Stephen, it's interesting you mentioned the, the Draugr from Skyrim, because um, you've seen Drow, you've seen Duragar, you've not seen what happens when the two mate, uh, which is... <laughs> Did you roll your eyes at me, Dan? Yes. <laughs> Trying to give you notes, man. I'm trying to help with this. Um, last last question I have for you guys for the night, um, unless you wrap up, is directed at you, Rachel. So kind of towards the end of this, we have been seeing more and more of Tuli's backstory, um, your conversation with Lilith at the, um, the dining room table, uh, bringing back up um, kind of your time in Apori with uh, bod, uh, being stabbed in the middle of the night. That was kind of fun. Um, just give us your initial kind of reaction of Tuli being thrust into the spotlight of, um, how's, how's Tuli doing right now? Like the ending of episode 50 is, I mean, fairly intense, not, I mean, guess you're not intense. You're in a cave. So, I mean, you know, how, is, how's Tuli doing? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, That's a good question. <laughs> it's hard to separate out how Thule feels and how Rachel feels. I'm not great at separating the character from the person. Um, but I, Rachel feels kind of a little bit anxious, honestly, of like, uh, I don't love being in the spotlight. Uh, but I think that Thule is a really cool character and I'm really excited by how Dan has had this play out. Um, so whenever we end with Thule in a death match, which <laughs> seems to happen a lot, <laughs> I, I do get anxious about it. I think that Thule is fine. I think that she is very resilient. I think that she has had to be resilient because of where she comes from. She, to be like a typical Valley girl who's really hopeful and just wants to make friends, um, for somewhere like a Pori to produce someone like that, she would have to be a really resilient person. So she's kind of, um, uh, I think she is fighting a rising darkness. I will say that because mm -hmm. of an anger that, uh, a banked fire that simmers within her. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, two stemming from her love for her family and her mentor, Chigasu. Um, so 
Something is coming to conflict with that hopeful, optimistic personality. Yeah, exactly. The poor. I was like, can you do it for us again? Well, it's basically two Texas Longhorns (laughs) (laughs) sideways. Yeah. So I, as a as a faithful podcast listener, I was like, yeah, I don't know what she like King Tutton, like Doctor Strange, or like what is going on. And then I heard a lot of Longhorns. I was like. (laughs) <laughs> that's essentially it that's exactly it yeah There's i also i also i picture you just kind of throwing those things in and dan's over here going like yeah that's great that's that's definitely what the hands <laughs> um well i'll wrap it up here um thank you guys uh just know that you guys are entertaining it's fun to follow where the half dozen has been and the half dozen will be. Uh, it's not just Australia that's that's feeling it. It's also North America. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, I'm in North America, so maybe I am. So I'm enjoying the time. Uh, you guys are doing a great job. Uh, continue up the good work. And uh, we'll see you next time. And we're excited that Joffrey got an upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, 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 kid. Thanks, kid. Good night, Raleigh.